Okay, amen. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And I'm starting a series today that I'm going to call Transcend, okay? A lot of times we talk about going to another level or things like that, but I love this word transcend. It's actually a word that the Lord reminded me of earlier this week. And the meaning of transcend is to rise above or go beyond normal limits. How many of you guys would like to rise above what is normal? Amen? Rise above what is natural. How many of you want supernatural life? Hey, do you want a supernatural life? All right, I have news for you. You will never get a supernatural life unless you transcend what is normal, unless you rise above and go beyond normal limits. God will help you to do that, but you have to want it, and you have to want to go for it. Amen? And uh, I'm going to be focusing in this series on Elijah. And uh, just to remind you of this, I'm going to be reminding you of this every day while we do this series, okay? Elijah was a man just like us. What does that mean? Everything that Elijah did, you can do. Amen? So we're talking about Elijah, and we're talking about how to become more like Elijah. Did you know that you can become like Elijah, Tippy? All right. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's move on. Let's get into 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 30 to 33. And here we talk about uh, King Ahab, okay? Now, Ahab, son of Omri, did what, what, what the Lord considered evil. And I want you guys to see this. He was worse than all the kings who were before him. And by the way, he was worse than all the kings after him as well, all of the kings of Israel, okay? It wasn't enough that he committed the same sins of Jeroboam, who was the previous king. He also married Jezebel, daughter of King Ethbaal of Sidon. Ahab then served and worshipped Baal, and he did more to make the Lord God of Israel furious than all the kings of Israel who came before him. Now, I've underlined these two, actually three things here, but the first two things, basically I'm showing you that the Bible says he was the worst king ever, okay? And then it says the reason why was because he also, in addition to doing all of those other sins that all the other kings used to do, he also married the wrong girl. He married a girl named Jezebel. That's why he was the worst. Are you with me? Okay. I hope there's no one named Jezebel in the room. That's not a good name uh, to name anybody. And by the way, Jezebel is not a mermaid. Okay, all right? Jezebel is uh, is someone in the Bible, all right? Now, it goes on to say in 1 Kings 21, 25, that there was no one else like Ahab. It says it a second time in the Bible. When the Bible says you're bad twice, you're really bad, okay? All right? It actually says that he was bad twice, and it says he was really bad at the urging of his wife, okay? Uh, he sold himself to do what the Lord considered evil. Guys, I I want you to know that the gate to evil is wrong partnership, all right? The Bible says don't be unequally yoked with a non-believer. The Bible is serious about that because whoever you partner with, whether in marriage or in any other way, you're going to end up influenced, okay? So you really need to be careful with the partnerships in your life. Now, I want you to just understand this. Elijah, who is considered one of the most powerful prophets in the history of Israel, was never mentioned in the Bible before this. Okay, uh, We know that he existed. We know that he was already a prophet, but nothing ever happened that was mentioned in the Bible before this. Let me tell you what is needed for there to be a false pro uh, for there to be a powerful prophet. There needs to be false ones first, okay? Uh, let me tell you what's needed for there to be a powerful prophet. There needs to be a big problem, okay? There needs to be evil. No prophet ever showed up in the Bible unless first there was a big problem. Some of you guys, you want to be prophets. I want you to know, if you want to be a prophet, it means you're going to be dealing with big problems, okay? All right? If there's no problems, you're not going to be a prophet. Are you guys with me on that? All right. Now, let's move on to the next slide. Elijah is considered one of the greatest prophets ever by Christianity and Judaism also. The main enemies for Elijah were King Ahab, his wife Jezebel, and literally hundreds of false priests and false prophets, mostly for 
Baal and other affiliated gods and more people like Asherah and some of those that were affiliated with Baal. Now, Ahab was passive, and that was his main problem, okay? Uh, he married a woman who was a princess from a pagan land, which is Phoenicia, okay? Sidon was a town in Phoenicia or a city in Phoenicia, and he let her control him. Now, I want you guys to see this. You may not have seen this before. Jezebel's dad was King Ethbaal, okay? And he was the king of Sidon. Now, Ethbaal literally means to live under the favor of Baal. That's how, that, that's how serious of a worshiper of Baal his parents were. They actually named him after the god, okay? They actually said, this guy lives under the favor of Baal. And so she was really a serious worshiper of Baal, and it was Jezebel who raised up the Baal religion in Israel, okay? Now, I'm going to ask you guys this question. I'm going to answer it. Who is Baal? It's the next screen, all right? And this is very interesting. This is something you guys need to understand if you're going to understand the miracles of Elijah. Baal was the supreme god of the Phoenician people and other peoples who worshipped him. He was known to be a god of fertility for land and for children, okay? The reason why people prayed to him was because they wanted more crops and they wanted more kids, okay? Uh, he was also very often depicted holding a lightning bolt, Okay, you guys have, have uh, seen the Greek mythology where some of the gods throw lightning. Baal was like that before there were Greek gods. Okay, Baal was the one with the lightning bolt. Okay, and uh, he supposedly provided rain, and he was also thought to be in control of lightning. Those who worshipped him were wanting more prosperity. That was their goal. That's why they worship Baal. Okay, uh, they wanted more crops, children, victory over enemies, all of this kind of thing. Now, worship of Baal included things like prostitution with temple priestesses. Okay, uh, you would not have wanted to be a priestess, okay, uh, in the times of Baal. And by the way, guys, I want you to know they selected the most beautiful women from the land, okay, to become the priestesses of Baal. And so their worship included going to church and paying to be with a priestess, okay? Now, this kind of sounds sick, but I want you guys to know there are still religions that do this today, okay? There are still religions that do this. Uh, as a matter of fact, there have been cases in America where the police have closed down churches that are practicing this, okay? There was one about 20 years ago in my hometown where they closed down a church that was actually practicing prostitution, okay? And I want, the, the reason why I bring this up, guys, is because the enemy is going to always try to mix religion with other things, okay? And I'm trying to let you guys see. This is one of the reasons why they wanted to worship Baal, because it legitimized their lust, okay? It legitimized their desire to gratify the flesh. It also meant uh, oftentimes sacrifice of children. People sacrifice usually the firstborn child to Baal. Next slide. Why would the Israelites want to worship Baal? The number one reason is this. I want you guys to track with me for a second, okay? I, I want to make sure that the slide is here, okay? The number one reason, I've already said this, is for prosperity. And I want you guys to, to, to think about this for a minute, and I want you to track with me for a minute, because you might have been involved in ministries that are more like Baal worship than real Christianity, okay? There are ministries today that call themselves Christianity, but they're all about prosperity. That's not Christianity, okay? God actually has some qualifications on the prosperity. Jehovah, the God of Christianity, does not promise what Baal promises. Jehovah says he will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory that are in Christ Jesus, all right? Guys, I don't know about you, but I have some wants that are a lot bigger than my needs, Okay, I don't want a Toyota. Hello, how many of you guys want a Toyota? I don't want a Toyota. You know what I want? I want a Ferrari. Hello, are you guys with me? But you know what? God has provided me an awesome Toyota. 
Are, are you with me? Okay. He has met my needs, not my wants. Okay. Are you guys with me on that? Now, if I wanted a Ferrari, I would need to go and find, you know, a religion that's going to be a little more like Baal worship that's going to promise me the Ferrari. Okay. But that's not real worship. All right. Do you guys understand why they would want to do that? There's a lot of churches that actually uh, run their ministries that way. All right. Uh, Jehovah says he will prosper you and keep you in good health as your soul Prospers. What does that mean? If you want to prosper, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ must grow first. Are you with me? Baal is not a God of relationship. Jesus Christ is the God of relationship. Jehovah will not give you everything you want just because you do rituals. You know, a lot of people wish they could just come to church and light a few candles and pray a few prayers and, you know, give in the offering and then boom, it's like a slot machine or it's like or it's like going to Vegas or Macau or something like that. That is not what Christianity is all about. Christianity is about your soul prospering. And as your soul prospers, God will put you in good health and cause you to prosper as as well. Are you guys with me? All right. Uh, to the Israelites, that was not exciting. That was not what they wanted. They wanted other promises. They wanted the promises of Baal. So uh, another reason why they would worship Baal is to gratify the lust of the flesh. We already talked about that with the prostitution, to worship something that they can see, to be like other people, to be able to be religious and sensual at the same time, all right? Uh, this is something that is live and well today. Now, I want to show you guys a verse, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31, okay? And this says, prophets prophesy lies. Priests rule under the prophets' directions. And my people love this. But what will you do in the end? You guys, you know why there's false teachings? You know why there's false prophets? You know why there's false teachers? Because that's what people want to hear. That's why, okay? People love to get their ears tickled by the false prophets and the false teachers and the false teachings. Are you guys with me? It has always been that way, and it continues to be that way. Now, let's move on to Revelation chapter 2, okay? And I want you guys to know that Jezebel was a specific person back in the days of Elijah, but Jezebel is not a specific person anymore. She is a high-level spirit, something that we would call a principality, okay? And I want to ask you guys this question, where does she operate, okay? And, and I want you to think about this practically, okay? I, I want you to know you're not going to find Jezebel in the bar. You are not going to find Jezebel at the bowling alley. You're not going to find Jezebel, uh, you know, in, in all of those places outside where you're going to find her is in church. Okay, and the scripture shows us that, and this is one of the reasons why we, the church, must really watch out for Jezebel. Now, Revelation chapter uh, 2 is basically Jesus giving uh, the apostle John directions or, or messages to write to the churches uh, of that day. And he wrote this to the church in a place called Thyatira, and he says this to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? These are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like Burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. He starts out with a compliment. Guys, does this sound like a good church? Right here? Yeah. You know, it's a church of what? It's a church of love and faith. It's a church of service and and perseverance. It's a church that, that the Lord Jesus Christ actually says, I am proud of you. You guys are actually doing now more than you did at first. That's a pretty awesome church, okay? But he goes on, and we move on to verse 20, and he says this. Nevertheless, 
I have this against you, okay? It's kind of like going to a parent-teacher conference. How many of you guys have ever been to a parent-teacher conference? The first 20 minutes, the teacher tells you how awesome your kids are. And then the last 10 minutes, they tell you how terrible your kids are, okay? All right, this was the approach that God used. He said, you guys are growing. You guys are full of love. You guys are awesome. However, there's one problem, okay? And the problem is this. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Now, that's the same kind of attitude that Ahab had, okay? Ahab allowed her to control him. He tolerated her. And this is Jesus speaking through the apostle John. He says, you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. Where? In the church. Who is Jesus talking to? The church. This is not outside of the church. Are are you guys with me? This is in the church. This is in an awesome church. This is in a good church. Hello. Not a false church. A good one. A growing one. A church that's doing better now than they did last week. Okay? All right? You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. What does that mean? Jezebel's spirit promotes loose living, okay, immorality type living, and idolatry, okay? Food sacrificed to idols is just another way of saying idolatry, okay? And so basically a Jezebel spirit is really a spirit that comes across as prophecy, comes across as a leader who is very dynamic, who's able to foretell the future and is very powerful spiritually. They're the one that is able to mislead servants by doing what? Teaching wrong teachings. That's Jezebel. Jezebel teaches wrong teachings, okay? Are you guys with me? All right? So, uh, you know, there's a lot of scholars who wonder if Jesus was actually talking about a particular person in Thyatira. Most scholars do believe that Jesus was. There was probably a lady in that church uh, who had risen up to be a leader in that church, was probably not the pastor, but was probably one of the leaders, and had really gotten the hearts of a lot of people uh, and, and had, been, had sounded really spiritual, and everybody was really impressed with her prophecies, maybe even with her signs and wonders and healings and all kinds of things, okay? It was a really powerful person, and Jesus says... I have this against you. You guys have fallen for her. You guys have fallen for her tricks. You guys have been impressed with her charisma. You've been impressed with her ability to prophesy. And now she's led you into some really wrong teachings, okay? And I want you guys to know Jezebel's spirit fuels many teachings in the church today. The hyper teachings, okay? Hyper prosperity, hyper grace. A lot of these teachings are fueled by Je- by, by uh, Jezebel. The selfish or soulish teachings, you know, the ones that that say you can do whatever you want and 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 if you've been chosen by God to go to heaven you're just going to heaven you don't have to do anything you don't even have to repent of your sins okay all of those are Jezebel type teachings uh, all of the man made kingdom teachings are really fueled by a spirit of Jezebel guys that's one of the reasons why we're very strong about not building our kingdom but we build God's kingdom because to build uh, with a denominational mindset can be Uh, from a spirit of Jezebel. Are you guys with me on that? Okay, so let's move on. Now, Revelation chapter 2 verse 21 says this. I have given her time to repent of her immorality. Isn't that amazing? God always gives time. Okay, I've given her time to to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. Guys, what we have to do is we have to, to understand that when we have been idolatrous or when we've been adulterous in our relationship with God, you know what that means? That means that we pursue other things and not God. We don't make God number one. Okay. 
What we need to do is repent. Guys, it takes repentance from wrong teachings to avoid penalties. Amen? I want you guys to know something. If, if you believe a wrong teaching, there is a penalty coming for you. Okay, there is a problem coming your way, and it's not coming from the enemy, it's coming from God. Okay, there is a penalty coming, and the only way to avoid it is to repent. Now, you know what the, the good thing about repentance is? It's actually not that hard. <laughs> it's not that hard to repent. All you have to do is say, Lord, I recognize that I have fallen for wrong teachings, and I not only apologize, but I want to change my mindset to be in alignment with your word, all right? That's how you break free from Jezebel. Now, he goes on in verse 23, and he says, I will strike her children dead, that all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds, all right? Let's move on to the next verse, verse 24. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, and this is one of my one of the most enlightening scriptures in the whole Bible, if you ask me, okay? To you who do not hold to her teaching. What does that mean? Like, you draw a line down the middle of the church, half of the people were listening to the Jezebel person, and the other half were not, okay? that That's basically what was happening. They, they were like in the middle of a possible split, okay, uh, due to false teachings, all right? He said to the rest of the people in Thyatira, to you who do not hold our teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come, all right? Now, this is very interesting. The, the apostle John, Jesus speaking through him, says that Satan uh, lures people with so-called deep secrets. Guys, when someone starts telling you about a deep teaching, you know, that like you have to have special revelation in order to understand, like you have to have like gone to the third heaven or something in order to understand this new deep teaching. Can I just tell you, that's Satan. That's not God, all right? I want you guys to know that if anybody starts talking to you about secret things, you know what? Because I'm so favored, because I'm so blessed, because I pray so much, and because I've fasted 40 days, God has shown me things that are not even in the Bible, all right? Anybody starts talking like that, that's Satan. That is not God. Okay, I want you guys to so know the word of God tells us that we need to stick with the scriptures. Amen. The Holy Spirit will always lead us back to the scriptures. God has established his scriptures as his foundation, as his filter. And so I'm just warning you right now. Be careful. Be really careful of people who talk about deep or secret things, okay? Because uh, a lot of times that really leads uh, to people being led astray by a spirit of Jezebel. Are you guys with me? You got, Some of you guys have really wide eyes right now, okay? All right? It's in the Bible. You guys can read this for yourselves, all right? Now, let's move on. And I want to show you how God used Elijah to directly confront the power of Baal. The reason why I want to show you this is because this is what you're called to do. You are called to do what Elijah does, okay? I want you to see this. Now, God called Elijah to directly confront the power of Baal and to make a fool out of Baal, okay? 1 Kings 17, verses 1 to 6. Elijah, who was from Tishba, remember they call him a Tishbite, okay, who had settled in Gilead. This is the first time we see him in the Bible. This is right after Ahab marries Jezebel, okay? He says to Ahab, I solemnly swear, as the Lord God of Israel, whom I serve, lives, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years unless I say so. 
Wow. Now, he was just repeating what God told him to do. We find out in the book of James that he prayed to God. He did not just declare it to Ahab, but he prayed to God. God led him in that prayer, and then he declared it to Ahab. Now, how many of you guys know your, your Bible very well? How long was there no do or rain? You guys remember? Three and a half years. Okay, three and a half years. Do you know what the Philippines would be like if there was no dew or rain in three and a half years? This place would be dust. <laughs> Are you with me? And you, know, a lot of people would be dead. You guys understand how how really severe this is? Okay, all right. So he decreed that there would not only be no rain but no dew. Now, why did God lead Elijah to do that? Because Baal is the god of rain. Hello, all right? Baal was the God that they prayed to for rain, okay? In order for their crops to increase. Let me tell you what God does when there's idolatry in someone's life. He cuts off the blessing affiliated with the idolatry. Are you with me? Okay, and I want you guys to know that this principle actually applies to all of us. I want to ask yourself these, I want you to ask yourself these questions. I put it at the bottom here, okay? Is there drought in your life? Is there drought in your life? If so, could this be the reason why? Could it be that God is confronting the idolatry in your life? Could it be? Because that's what God does. When you have a desire that is stronger than your love for God, that's idolatry. I have news for you because God loves you so much. He's going to say, oh, you know what? If that thing grows, it's going to kill you. Drought. He decrees a drought in your life. And you know what we have to do, guys? If we want to break through, if we want to transcend... We need to recognize those things in our life that are idolatrous, and we need to say, oh, Lord, I didn't realize that, that I loved something else more than you, and when you repent, the rain will come. Hello, are you guys with me? A lot of us have drought in our lives. Is God showing you that what you are trusting in or pursuing is nothing more than idolatry? That may be the reason for drought in your life, all right? Some of you have taken pictures of that already, okay? All right, let's move on. Now, in verse 2, this, this scripture continues, Then the Lord spoke his word to Elijah, Leave here, turn east, and hide beside the Cherith River, which is east of the Jordan River. You can drink from the stream, and I've commanded ravens, to feed you there. This is interesting. As soon as the prophet prophesied drought, God said, you better go into hiding, otherwise they're going to kill you. Okay? Guys, I want you to know, nobody likes prophets who prophesy droughts. Nobody. Can I just, can I just tell you something that I'm aware of right here, right now? Because of what I just said on the previous screen about droughts, some of you don't like me now. Seriously, you don't want to hear that. You want to hear, oh, blessing, 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 prosperity, prosperity, prosperity. Oh, let's do, you know, this and this and that and that. And, and, and you know, you, you just want things the easy way. That's human nature, guys. I understand that. But if you're really hungry for God, if you're really thirsty for God, if you want to find out God's real heart, you're going to understand that God deals with our stuff. And he often decrees droughts in our life. True prophets are going to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Can I get a better amen on that? Amen. amen. Okay, all right. So he said, you're going to have to go into hiding, all right? Now, I'm going to bring you guys to my final uh, scripture today, okay? And uh, this is actually the solution to the Jezebel spirit that is in many of our lives, all right? And this is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. 
How many of you guys know this scripture already? It's the, the scripture about putting on the full armor of God. Now, you guys know that I often use NIV, but I'm using God's word translation today because there's some key uh, translation issues that I want you guys to see that you may have never seen before, okay? It says here, finally, receive your power from the Lord. I love that. You know why the Bible says that? Because you can actually receive power from other sources. You can. You can receive power from other sources. Big mistake. <laughs> All right? You need to intentionally receive your power from the Lord. Don't take matters into your own hands. And from his mighty strength. And he goes on and says, put on all the armor that God supplies. In this way, you can take a stand against the devil's strategies. What does this mean, guys? Unless you put on the full armor of God, you cannot win. Hello. Are you with me? You need all of the armor, okay? Now, verse 12 says this. This is not a wrestling match against a human opponent. However, it is a wrestling match, okay? But it's not a wrestling match against a human opponent opponent okay and he goes on and he says we are wrestling with rulers authorities powers who govern the world of darkness and spiritual forces that control evil in the heavenly world i don't know exactly which one of those jezebel is but she's one of them <laughs> okay are you guys with me on that okay we're dealing with spirits guys we're dealing with forces that are trying to manipulate and seduce our lives so he goes on and he says this, for this reason, take up all the armor that God supplies, then you will be able to stand during these evil days or also the coming evil days. Once you have overcome all obstacles, you will be able to stand your ground. You point at your neighbor right now and say, you need to overcome all of your obstacles. Come on, point at your neighbor right now. You need to overcome all of your obstacles, all right? Then you'll be able to stand your ground. Let's move on to verse 14. So then, take your stand. This is how you do spiritual warfare right here, guys. Taking your stand. He says this, fasten truth around your waist like a belt. What does that mean, guys? You're only interested in one thing, truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, all right? You have to become obsessed with the truth, all right? And it says here, put on God's approval. Now, in other translations, it says the breastplate of righteousness, but people don't really know what that means, okay? All right, the righteousness of God is God's approval. Let me put it this way. If you don't have righteousness, you don't have God's approval. If you don't have righteousness, you're like in a battle and the flaming arrows are coming at you and there is nothing to cause them to bounce off. You're just hit and hit and hit until you're dead. You need God's righteousness. You need God's approval. Can I get a good amen on that? Amen. Okay, all right. Okay, that's how you do warfare. Put on your shoes so that you are ready to spread the good news that gives peace. How does this help you? How does it help you to be ready to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let me explain something to you guys, okay? All right? I would not be able to preach the gospel if I was not in the word. Are you with me? Okay? However, most of the time when I read the word... It's protecting me from the enemy. It's not really me using that word for someone else. All right? But if I'm always preparing myself to preach the gospel, then I'm always going to be in the word, then I'm always going to be protected. Okay? Tell your neighbor right now, stay in the word. Stay in the word. Stay in the word. All right? That's a very, very important thing. All right. Now let's move on. It says, in addition to all these Take the Christian faith as your shield. Now, in other versions, it just says the shield of faith. In, in this version, it specifies Christian faith. I want you to know faith in faith is not faith. It's faith in God 
that is faith. It's faith in Jesus Christ that is faith, okay? It has to very specifically be Christian faith. It is your shield, and I want you to, 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 to see this. With it, the shield, okay, you can put out all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Does it say here that God puts out the flaming arrows? No. That is not what it says. What does it say? With faith, with Christian faith, with the shield of faith, you have the power. You have the ability. It's a God-given ability, but unless you do it, you're a sitting duck. Hello. You're going to be destroyed by the enemy unless you put out the fiery darts of the enemy. You know, guys, I, I, I want I want you to I want you to, to think of it in this way, okay? Let's say that I am literally in, you know, a, a, a war costume, a medieval war costume, all right? And I have a shield, you know, and 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 all of a sudden there are fiery darts coming my way from the enemy. I love the fact that they're fiery because you can see them coming. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Fiery darts coming from the enemy, and, and I'm just standing there like this. And I don't have God's approval on because I've been just doing whatever I want. I don't have the breastplate of righteousness. I don't have my shield of faith, okay? I'm not operating in faith. And I'm saying, God, protect me. You know what God says? Protect yourself. Put on the weapons that I have given you. Put on my righteousness. Put on my approval. And more than that, pick up your shield of faith and actually block the enemy. He's saying, I have given you those tools. I have given you everything you need for faith and righteousness and to live this life. I've given it all to you, but you're just not using it. If you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> All right? Are you guys with me? God expects you to block that stuff. So when you start to be down, when you start to be discouraged, when you start to be depressed, you know what you need to do? You need to rise up in faith. Amen? Stop pulling other people into your pit with you and instead rise up in in faith. Can I get a good amen on that? Yeah. Okay, all right. Rise up in faith. Now, with it, you can put out all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Also, take salvation as your helmet, all right? Unless you have salvation, you don't have your helmet. But why did God describe the helmet as our salvation? Because, guys, salvation is the renewing of your mind. Salvation is the changing of the way you think. If you don't change the way you think, you aren't really saved. Are you guys with me? Romans chapter 12. Don't be conformed to the patterns of thinking of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is how you offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to the Lord, by renewing your mind, okay? All right. And it says here, the final one, and take up God's word as the sword that the Spirit supplies. Wow. You know what? A lot of times, you know, uh, we think that, you know, being led by the Spirit is separate from the word. You know, we talk about the word and the Spirit. They work together, guys. They work together. You aren't really Spirit-led unless the Spirit is giving you the word of God, okay? That is the sword of the spirit. It is the word of God. If you're just, you know, calling out to the Holy Spirit and you're not using the word, you really aren't getting anywhere, amen? You need the word of God. Next verse, verse 18. It says here, pray in the spirit in every situation. Use every kind of prayer and request there is. For the same reason, be alert. Use every kind of effort and make every kind of request for all of God's 
people. Guys, I want you to know the reason why Elijah was powerful, because he was a man of prayer. He was a man of prayer. We're going to be talking about that more in this series. But I want you guys to know, you are never going to win any battle unless you win it in prayer. You're never going to win any battle unless you win it in prayer. And so what does it say? It says, pray in the Spirit. And I love this. When you're in trouble? No. Pray in the Spirit in every situation. In every situation. Now, I've left the little blue B there. You guys see the little blue B? Okay, all right. I've left that there. If you go to one of the websites or if you go to an actual uh, Bible and you look up Pray in the Spirit, you will find that actually it could have been translated another way as well. Okay, and I think that we need to, 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 to look at both translations. It says Pray in the Spirit or... Pray in your spirit. It does not necessarily mean pray in tongues. Hello. All right. Some people assume that that means pray in tongues. It does not necessarily mean that. It can include that, but it also includes what the Apostle Paul is talking about. Actually, every kind of prayer with understanding and without understanding. Are you guys with me? Not just when you're in trouble, but in every situation. God said, my house will be a house of prayer. Amen? So we really need to pray more and more and more. All right? So use every kind of effort to make every kind of request for all of God's people. Guys, can I just ask you for just a moment to just think about it and just be real, especially with the Holy Spirit working in this room right now. Let me just ask you this question that you need to answer for yourselves. Are you praying enough? Are you praying like this? Are you? And you know what, guys? I'm not. I need to rise up to this. I need to transcend where I am. How many of you guys can be honest and just wave your hand to me and say, yeah, Pastor Steve, I need to pray more. I need to transcend. Come on, raise your hands. Come on, wave your hand to me, okay? Almost everyone in this place, all right? All right, guys, final part here, okay? James chapter 5. I said the last one was the final one. My mistake, okay? Here's the final one. James chapter 5, verses 15 to 18, okay? And it says here, and I want to ask the ushers to go ahead and come and prepare to give us the Lord's Supper here today, all right? Uh, and the pastors to please serve them. Verse 15 says this, Prayers offered in faith will save those who are sick, and the Lord will cure them. Now, I want to challenge you in light of what we just read, okay? The Bible says if you're going to put out the fiery darts of the enemy, you need the shield of faith. I want to ask you guys a question. When someone is sick and when they say, would you please pray for me? How often do you think to yourself, uh, you know what? The last time I prayed for somebody, nothing happened. And you don't have faith. But you know what? You don't want to tell them that you don't have faith. And so you just kind of do a little prayer. And there's no faith there. I want you guys to know something. If you pray a prayer without faith, the fiery dart penetrates. And the sickness remains. Do you guys understand that? We need to have faith when we pray for those who are sick. And if we pray in faith... It says here, the Lord will cure them. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. That's how it works. If you have sinned, you will be forgiven. If you what? Ask for forgiveness in faith. Hello? You've got to ask for forgiveness in faith. So admit your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you will be healed. How many people in this room, you need healing today? Come on, raise your hand. I want to see who needs healing. You're going to receive it today. This is where it goes into Elijah. It says, your prayers offered by those who have God's approval are effective. The King James says this, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. Amen. What does the opposite of that mean? 
The prayers of an unrighteous person don't avail much. But the prayers of a righteous person produce a lot. And he goes on to say, verse 17, Elijah was human like us. What does that mean, guys? Elijah's prayer stopped the rain for three and a half years. Your prayer can do the same thing. Your prayer can shut down Ahab and Jezebel. Your prayer can heal somebody. Your prayer can set a captive free. Your prayer, if you will be righteous, if you will be a person that is so concerned about truth, and if you will put on the full armor of God, you can be like Elijah. Yet when he prayed that it wouldn't rain, no rain fell on the ground for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, and it rained, and the ground produced its crop. Guys, we're going to pray in this place today. Every kind of prayer, we are going to receive the righteousness of God. This is Communion Sunday, the Sunday that we take the Lord's Supper. And you guys, you guys know what we need to do right now? We need to take the Word of God and search our hearts. And just find anything that is not pleasing to God. And then we're going to, with righteousness, with God's approval, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. And we're going to pray prayers that cause droughts and lift droughts. Amen? Uh, go ahead and serve God's people, ushers.